I'll, I think I'll just start by just showing you this slide. This is sort of my favorite slide. This is a woman named, named Sharon uh, who was diagnosed in about 2000 with metastatic melanoma, uh, probably because she played a lot of tennis and had uh, repeated sunburns. Anyway, it was stage four. You can see the large tumor mass in her on the panel on the left in her, in her lung. Uh, and a pleural effusion of just loose cells down at the bottom. She had failed every therapy they threw at it, including not only chemotherapy, but, uh, but immunotherapies, including high dose IL 2 and a dendritic cell pulse vaccine uh, to no avail. She progressed. Uh, her doctor, Tony Rebus at UCLA, uh, told her, you know, we're at, we're at an end. We don't have anything else uh, except there's this new drug called ipilimumab. And I'll, Come to that in a minute. That uh, has never been in people before. This was a phase one trial, and if you, you know, we don't know it could be dangerous. It could we don't know if it'll work? But would you try it? She said, "I'll do anything. I just want three years, three sorry, three months until my son graduates from high school." And so that was in 2001. Uh, she got a single dose of three mg per kg of ipilimumab, um, and I visited Tony in 2011. And she had just come back in for her first decade checkup. And you can see the CAT scan on her right. It's 10 years later with no further treatment, no anything in between. And she's still doing fine today. So she's almost 19 years out now, uh, again, after a single um, uh, treatment, after being told she was hospice bound. And, and uh, luckily, that's not a rare occurrence with this type of, of treatment. So why would you want to use immunotherapy? Very quickly. Uh, it's because cancer is a myriad, is, is, is a disease of mutations. You get mutations in cells that control normal behavior of cells. After a while, they go awry. They start growing when they shouldn't. They grow places they shouldn't grow. Um, these are caused by different enzymes that control different stuff. So one of the things that's been tried for years is to sequence the genome, find those genes uh, that are driving the cancer, come up with something that inhibits them, and treat and theoretically, you could cure the cancer, and you can get remarkable uh, responses. The problem is that the genome of cancer is so unstable, by the time you can detect it, there are already mutations that can make it resistant to the drug that you tried. And so after a while, it comes back. And then you come in, in with a new one, after a while, it comes back. Uh, the most popular drug of this sort for treating melanoma is one called uh, vimurafenib, which targets a mutation called BRAF that's present in 60% of melanoma patients. There are 13 different ways that have been identified so far that a tumor can escape that. And so those therapies are very useful for buying time, but they just there's no way to see how they can be curative just because of the complexity of the number of genes involved. Immunotherapy has three things that, that make it suitable for the job. One is specificity. We know now that what T cells are occupied with in cancer is detecting the products of those mutations. Uh, the targeted drugs that people have used for so long target only the driver mutations. The rest of them are irrelevant to the cancer biologist, but the immune system doesn't care what the function is. The immune system's job is to find something that's different going on that ought not to be there and deal with it, most of the time by killing the cell that has it. So if there's mutations in there, and a typical melanoma cell can have 3,000 in different mutations, which is why it's so hard to treat with conventional therapies, but it makes it a sitting duck for the immune system because many of those could be targets for T cells. And so I'm going to be talking a lot about T cells. By the way, the Lasker Prize was awarded two days ago for Max Cooper and, and Jacques Smith for Miller, sorry, for discovering, you know, that there were two immune cells, B cells and T cells. Uh, finally, the immune system offers something that's absolutely unique, and that's memory. Once you've got T cells of a given specificity, you've got them for the rest of your life. So if the tumor comes back, you can reawaken it to go attack it. And the fine one is, final one is adaptability. You've probably got somewhere around 70 million different T cells that recognize different things in your body, and that's changing with time, and it's influenced by your environment and what's going on. So I would argue that that many different specificities is easily a match for mutations in the 30,000 genes that a, that a tumor cell has. So um, anyway, it's been a goal to, of people since 1906, actually is the first 
uh, recorded proposal to use the immune system to treat cancer by Paul Ehrlich, who was a uh, Nobel Prize winning chemist. But uh, he said it would be done with antibodies, although he thought it would be done with antibodies to tumor cells, not to the immune system. So you know, we're there, but a little bit different than, than, than he thought. Um, but one of the things that, as a basic scientist, that I really believe is that we can't attack any complex disease situation without knowing intimately the biology of the cell that we're dealing with, unless we know the mechanisms of, for example, T cells. If you're going to try to mobilize T cells to go attack cancer, you need to know what the process is. You know, is it just flipping a switch or something else? Um, and so I've devoted myself since the early 80s in studying T cells. And so this just illustrates here one of the problems that you have because T cells actually require two signals to get activated. One of them is the antigen receptor shown by that blue thing in the middle. Uh, and that's what recognizes the different thing. That's the thing that there's 70 million or so different of those, ones of those that can recognize different stuff. Um, that's, that gives it specificity. We worked out the structure of that molecule in 1982, uh, but it turns out that's not the whole story. If you hit that molecule with something that activates it, that does not fully activate a T cell. Turns out there's another molecule called CD28 that's also required. Uh, it binds to a, problem, a protein called B7, one or two, there's two of them, uh, that are on certain normal cells, uh, particularly cells that are prone to virus infection, but anyway, what we know is that tumors don't have those molecules. Um, and and uh, so that's one of the reasons you get cancer and it's hard to treat because at first they're invisible to the immune system because they can, they're can they loaded with antigens. And we proved this in the late 80s by putting the B7 gene into tumor cells and they won't grow anymore. They get eliminated instantly by the immune system. So they've got plenty of antigens. They've got plenty of things for the immune system to recognize, but they just can't see it because they don't have that 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 uh, second switch. Um, and so what has to happen is tumor cells start dying. Maybe it gets big and can't get enough oxygen or whatever. Anyway, um, they die of necrotic death. That causes inflammation. These cells, we, for convenience, called antigen-presenting cells. Anyway, they come in and they hoover up all the dying tumor cell bits and redisplay some of them on their surface. They've got the B7 molecule on their surface, so they put the antigens from the tumor out on their surface, in the context of B7 and bingo, now the T cells can go. They get signal one, which is the antigen receptor, and single two, which is the, the co-stimulatory receptor, or in other words, a signal mediated by CD28, and we showed that in 1988 or so. So you can think of the, the T cell antigen receptor like the ignition switch, and CD28 like the gas pedal, you know? You've gotta have the gas pedal there too to get it going. When that happens, a very a wonderful thing happens in T cells. Normally, they're just cruising around looking for something. They go through all your tissues and through the blood and everywhere. When they see something and they get both those signals, then they change and they start dividing because you've got to get, you know, you've got to go from a few uh, to hundreds of thousands to millions of them to get the army out in the field to go and deal with the virus or the cancer or whatever it is. So they start dividing really quickly about every six hours at their peak. So they're growing like bacteria to generate that army within a matter of days to protect you. It's really fascinating. But then that can't go on forever because if it does, your immune system will kill you. Uh, so there's a molecule called CTLA-4 that we discovered in about 1993 or so that's actually the breaks that comes up and keeps CD28 from working. And so it stops the T cells then from continuing that, and you have to have that because if you don't, your immune system will, will kill you. You've got to stop it from going on that, that programmed expansion. And we showed that because we eliminated the gene in mice, and when they're about three weeks old, they fill up with T cells and, and pass away. So the immune system's a wonderfully power thing, powerful thing, but it has to be exquisitely regulated to keep it from causing problems. But anyway, this is a hardwired process. It has nothing really fundamentally to do with cancer. This happens anytime you get an immune response to anything. Um, but the, in cancer, we think the deal is that the tumor gets a head start because it doesn't have the ability to give the CD28 signal. And so once they do get turned on, it's a race. You know, if you get enough T cells to take out the tumor, 
before they get turned off, you know, the immune system wins. If you don't, the tumor wins. Um, so we had the idea that you could keep, make that happen by just inactivating the brakes with an antibody to CTLA-4. You just keep the brakes from working for a time and let the T cells keep going and maybe the tumor will go away. Um, and when I thought about this, thought of this, it was, it was compelling for a number of reasons. One is you're treating the immune system, not the cancer cell, right? I mean, that, that drug is, has nothing to do with the cancer cell. It's hitting the immune system. So this could conceivably work against any kind of cancer. You don't have to change the drug every time you change. The, the cancer is different because it's the same T cell. Uh, and the second thing is, since this process starts with some tumor cell death, you ought to be able to use this in combination with chemotherapy or radiation, conventional therapies, or those genomically targeted drugs I was talking about, and really give them the features of the immune system anyway. So just to show you it does work, uh, this is one of our early experiments that uh, uh, we put in the mid-90s showing an experimental tumor on mice growing the black line if you inject its size versus uh, time. If you block CD28 with an antibody, they grow faster, showing that there is an immune response. It's just not sufficient to take it out. But if you inject nsc 4 antibodies out of that one thing, out of all the things that are going on when a tumor cell counters the immune system, that uh, causes the tumors just to melt away. And those mice are permanently immune to re-challenge with that tumor for the rest of the life. So the question was, could we do this in humans? So there was a lot of skepticism and it took a while. I don't have time to go through that. But we finally teamed up with a company called Metarex. They had the, a, a perfect thing to help us with the work. They had, had, they had mice whose immunoglobulin genes had been replaced with human. So we could immunize them and make a, an antibody to human CTLA-4 that was fully human itself so the if you injected the people, their immune system wouldn't attack it. And so this went into many people, including Sharon, that I told you earlier. Um, and there were remarkable tumor regressions in melanoma, prostate, kidney, bladder, uh, other, other tumors, as I mentioned. Uh, so as we predicted, um, it worked against a lot of different kinds of cancer. There were adverse events, which we never saw in mice or in the talk studies that were done prior to going into human studies. but. There are typically a lot of itises, inflammatory, they're, they're in, in reactions that undoubtedly involve the immune system, but they're not really autoimmune because you can give steroids and treat them. Uh, the symptoms disappear, then you wean the patient off steroids and they don't come back. Uh, although now we know that hundreds of thousands of people have been treated. There are these very rare phenomena, including uh, type 1 diabetes uh, that can occur, and in some cases a T-cell-mediated heart problem. But this is what uh, Dr. Spear referred to earlier. It comes up here and went too far. Um, this just shows, this was uh, in 2015 where there were sufficient patients, 5,000, for whom there was 10 years follow-up. What you can see is about three years, the survival curve flattens out and stays there for 10 years and, and beyond. So what that says is nobody's dying of melanoma after about three years. And so I think we could use the word cure uh, to talk about those patients, which is something that I do, you know, very carefully because, you know, the technical definition of cure for cancer is there's not a single cancer cell left in the body. And that's an impossible thing to prove. And so I think that's not very useful to the patient who's worrying about it a lot. But when you hit a situation like this, I think people that are five years or whatever out uh, don't have to worry so much. So why 20%? Why didn't 100%? Well, it turns out there's another checkpoint. Actually, there's several more. One of them called PD-1 that was discovered by Tosco Hanjo in, in uh, um, um, the early 90s. He didn't really know what he did. It, it, we thought it played a role in T cell development. But in uh, about 2001, he, with uh, some collaborators um, from Harvard, showed that it was another checkpoint that had two ligands, PDL1 and L2. One of its ligands can actually be expressed on tumor cells and suppress them. Um, so this is an actually, and it, it turns mature T cells off. CTLA-4, I want to stress, works when they're first being primed. This works on fully differentiated T cells 
and just inhibits their function at, at the end. When they try to attack a tumor cell, they make gamma interferon, and that upregulates PDL1 in the tumor, which then turns the T cell off. So it's also um, very useful. These are the response rates in melanoma, non small cell lung cancer, and kidney cancer. Uh, in this early phase one, it had no responses in colorectal cancer, although now we know that patients there that have a lot of mutations do respond quite well. And there are also no responses against uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer. But, but uh, we figured that out, we meaning uh, Pam Sharma and I at the um, immunotherapy platform at MD Anderson, we figured out a combinatorial way to get very good responses there that will be published here in a short amount of time. And entering some final uh, registration trials later this year. Okay, these are two different things. They both check points. You put them together, you know, which we did it in mice, and they're at least additive. And this shows what happens if you do this in humans. Uh, that blue line is nivolumab, which is the name of the PD-1 drug, and, and ipilimumab goes up to almost 60%. Now, this is your early data here, tracking it for a year and a half, but I can tell you, that these patients have now, and this is a randomized, this is a proper randomized trial. These patients have now been followed for four and a half years, and it's still over 55%. And so there's no reason to think that that's not going to be good for 10 years or more. So uh, here's the unprecedented thing where we can get these durable responses, uh, you know, almost miraculous, considering, as you heard earlier, when we started this work, if you were diagnosed with stage four uh, melanoma, the median survival was seven months after diagnosis, and there was no drug that had ever lengthened that at all. And now we're talking about close to 60% of patients could be given four and a half, five, ten years maybe. Uh, we'll know soon. Uh, but as I said, this melanoma and lung cancer, other things like that, because the number of mutations are pretty much sitting ducks. So. Any event, there's now lots of uh, action in this particular around PD-1. There's seven different antibodies to that out there. This is a partial list of the FDA approvals, meaning these drugs could be, you know, prescribed for any of those conditions by any doctor in the U.S. And more importantly, insurance has to pay for it uh, because they're quite expensive, a lot more expensive than they ought to be. I don't want to get sidetracked on that, but anyway, you can see melanoma, non-small cell, and small cell lung cancer, kidney cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, bladder cancer, head and neck, Merkel cell, which is a very, very nasty form of uh, skin cancer. And the one, the coolest one, though, is this MSI high DMMR. These are two different defects in DNA damage repair. And so if, you, if a can of cancer, there's a subtype within every histological type of tumor, there's a subgroup that has defects in DNA damage. They can't repair their DNA adequately. It makes the cancer more dangerous, but also generates more mutations, which the immune system attacks. It's been found that having those defects makes the, drug, makes the tumor responsive to immunotherapy. So for the first time, uh, you know, any, any, disease, any cancer of any type, it doesn't matter. Uh, what the histology is, if they have this particular genetic defect, they can be treated with these. Yes? Have you seen a look at an approach that's in the CAR cells? Yeah, for those. Yeah, but you have to make, unlike the CAR cells, which mostly you, could, you make to a common antigen, and a lot of people, you'd have to make a new one for each patient with these because those, the antigens there are different in every tumor and every, in every patient. Um, and then finally, some more cancer. As I said, this is this is very truncated. This is about a, I stopped about a year ago. There's a, there are new approvals about every two weeks or so for some indication, and now we're beginning to see more uh, combinations. Um, and so, uh, the the PD one C like four combination has uh, been approved now in, in kidney cancer. The response rate there is close to fifty percent. It's about to be approved in bladder cancer, which is going to get up. Pretty high. Uh, we're finding in other cancers there are other checkpoints like uh, one called Vista that we find in prostate cancer after treatment with NSCTLA4 um, that there's an antibody for. So we're soon going to be testing a triplet of antibodies against that one. And so, anyway, that's sort of what's happening now. Is determined. What we need to do is 
really study the mechanisms uh, that are involved in this uh, anti-tumor effect. Uh, and then also, as we begin to combine these with chemotherapy uh, radiation, uh, study the impact of the other agent on the immune system because, you know, especially particularly the genomically targeted things, that, which have never, ever been used in a, in a situation where there is an immune system involved until they go into people. All the preclinical work is done in mice without immune systems. And so their impact on the immune system is completely unknown for most of them. Uh, and we found there, there could be some surprises. But anyway, we need to be now understanding things. For example, um, there are a, a woman named Sylvie Fournier, who's probably the world's leader in radiotherapy of breast cancer. Um, I, did, I collaborated with her group a few years ago, and she sort of picked it up now, and she says, we're over-radiating. We're trying to kill the last tumor cell with the radiation. We don't need to do that. All we need to do is kill enough to cause... Uh, they let the immune system come in and get initiated and take it out. Uh, but the way we're doing it, we're killing the immune cells as soon as they come in. So her res whole research effort now is learning how to spare the immune system uh, in doing the therapy. The same is true of chemotherapy. You know, you can give chemotherapy, even though a lot of them aren't immunosuppressive. A lot of chemotherapy is actually turned out when they're examined in mice without immune systems. They don't work. <laughs> so... A lot of chemo works ultimately through the immune system, actually at least take it out the last cells. But you, know, you can time it, even if it does devastate T cells, you could give the drug to kill some tumor cells uh, and then wait and then start the immune therapy when there's still debris around and take care of that. Uh, so we need to do those sorts of studies to determine the best standard of care to use, identify new molecules, and, and develop some markers if we can, uh, which has been, we still cannot predict who's going to respond from baseline, but we can predict from people that are on therapies, you know, we can tell who's gonna respond or not so that you can quickly decide when you switch to a new uh, drug combination that didn't work. Now very quickly, I'd like to show you something that's become available. So we've got these two checkpoints, PD-1 and CTLA-4, and the tendency is because it turns out PD-1 has fewer side effects. And so a lot of people are working with it, say, well, you got two of them and PD-1 has fewer. They're not different. They're the same ones. They just don't occur as frequently. Um, so let's use PD-1. Uh, but they're really different. Uh, and some of the differences are shown here. As I already showed you, CTLA-4 is hardwired. It's part of every immune response. It's built in. Uh, during priming, uh, PD-1 is an induced resistance. It actually s seems to exist to protect the fetus from destruction by the mother's immune system, detecting genes that are from the father, you know, and, and so PD-1 is all over the deciduate and the cells around the surrounding the fetus and protect it from, and so tumors just seem to have picked it up. Anyway, CTLA-4 work, works very early during priming by targeting co-stimulation. Uh, PD-1 later working on differentiated T cells inhibits their function. It's been shown that CTLA-4 can recruit new T cells to a response that haven't been involved, uh, whereas PD-1 can't. It just expands the ones that are already there, um, but have been paralyzed and quit dividing. Um, anyway, uh, I'll show you in a moment. They hit different targets. We've shown that CTLA-4 can move T cells into an otherwise cold tumor tumor that doesn't have any infiltrations, immune infiltrates, uh, like kidney and prostate cancer, for example. Checkpoint block, block eight hasn't worked there very well because there's no inherent infiltrates to remove the checkpoints from. Uh, but when you give IPI, T cells go in uh, and alleviates that problem, at least in some cancers. PD-1 doesn't do that. Um, again, I told you about the adverse events. Um, and then disease occurrence with CTLA-4 after response are very, very rare. Usually they're focal, it can be dealt with with surgery, where at about two years, for example, after initiation of, of therapy, uh, about 15% of patients recur um, on, on PD-1. Um, but still high enough where it still may be, you know, the response rate's a little bit higher, so we don't yet know how that's gonna play out. But finally, the dosing um, is very different. With CTLA-4, you get four times at three-week intervals, typically. That's it, you stop. 
PD-1 is given about it, depending on the manufacturer, the antibody every two weeks for as long as two years. And so it's quite a long therapy. So I'm gonna rush through this again. So we decided to address this in a completely unsupervised way and identify the cells that are involved. And what we did uh, in, in the tumor injection, so what we did was use a type of analysis called time of flight cytometry. This is very high parameter flow cytometry. I don't want to go into the details of it, but we could measure 43 different things on cells at a time and really know what kind of cells they are you know, and what they're doing. We could put in markers to know if they're dividing or not, if they're functioning or not, you know, what they have, what they came from, et cetera. And then we can use these methods to, to, to really enumerate those cells. And then by keeping track of tumor size in individual mice, we could correlate the individual types of cells with if they changed, and if that change was associated with the change in the tumor or not, you know, or is it just some random thing? Anyway, just to go quickly through here, this is the setup. We harvest the tumors after treatment, uh, grind them up. This shows the raw data. It'll give you a headache to look at that very long, but it just shows you the different experimental groups with anacetyl A4 control or PD-1 at the top, and then the markers that we got on each group uh, at the bottom, which makes no sense until you look at it like this, where we separate it to the main types. And so um, what we see here is that there are these regulatory T cells uh, that are depleted by NSCTLA4, uh, decreased a little bit by PD-1. Um, those are positively affected with, with tumor cells, with tumor size. So these inhibit other T cells, and getting rid of them is a good idea. Although, after having shown you this mouse data, this doesn't seem to happen with the human antibody that's in trials now, so you gotta take that with a grain of salt. But the real action is in the CD4 effector cells and the CD8s, which are the two main kinds of T cells. Um, with CD4, as you can see on the left there, uh, the ones in red, that those that's the, the, the number of cells that are called Th1-like. They have a number of molecules. Uh, they're Th1, meaning they make gamma interferon and TNF-alpha. These are cells that can kill tumor cells with those cytokines. They also have a molecule called ICOS that if I have time, I'll come back to. Uh, those are expanded by CTLA-4, but not PD-1, um, and they are associated with smaller tumors. There's another population that's kind of nondescript. It doesn't matter, so we'll ignore that. If you go to CD8s, if you look at this population here, these are cells that are called effector T cells. They have, they're fully differentiated. They're the cells that are going around killing things. They're increased by both C to A4 in the red and PD-1 in green, as you can see. So both those antibodies increase those. Um, but the biggest change in CDH is the one to the left of that in green, the PD-1 high, TIM-3 high. They're also LAG-3 high. These are exhausted T cells. So this is what people you know, thought about PD-1 targeting is the exhausted T cells. Um, that They don't divide because PD-1, LAG-3, and TIM-3 are all three negative regulators of T cells that turn them off quite effectively off. But blocking PD-1 is enough to allow them to proliferate for a time. But, it, but what these data show us is that they still have that phenotype, so if the antibody goes away, they're gonna stop dividing again. So that may be why you have to give PD-1 for two years. Uh, it's because you just have to keep giving it to get them going. Uh, anyway, so PD-1 expands those and the other ones, the effector T cells. So just to summarize it. This is this is what you have with with C to A4. You got a CD4 population, CD8 effectors. PD-1, you get the CD8 effectors plus this exhausted phenotype, which is what everybody has been, as I said, has been concentrating on up to now. But really. Uh, and not the other type. Uh, so the, what happens when you mix these things? You know, this is an obvious question because it's the combination that's the best. And so is that just because you get more things? You have those exhausted cells in there and the CD4 from the CD8. So, I mean, both of them give you the CD8 effectors. So are they better because the CD4 adds the, the, the CTLA-4 adds the CD4 high cost cells and the CD8 then, I mean, the PD, one, sorry, adds you the CD8 that's exhausted, okay? And so, you know, in other words, 
when you put them together, you get A plus B. You get all four types now of cells, or what? Okay, well, the answer is probably not what you think. So this just shows the setup again very quickly. And just to show you the essential data, these are what we see when you concentrate on those exhausted cells, PD-1, LAG-3, TIM-3, triple positive losers. You know, they, they're not gonna divide unless they've got PD-1 around. And you can see the green there, they go up with NPD-1, with NF not with C to 4 This is what we showed you before. But when you add C to 4 they go way down. Uh, and so uh, that, that's a little weird, you know, because that's not what you might, you might think. But they diminish uh, as if, you know, PD-1 wasn't even there. They changed down to baseline. Uh, but what about the effector cells? Oh, and sorry, this just shows that, no, I've got another slide here. Anyway, the effector cells is the panel on the right. Those are those other cells that aren't exhausted. These are perfectly happy cells, but they have PD-1, and so they are inhibited somewhat by PD-1. If you block it, they can do better, but they're not exhausted. They don't absolutely have to have it to keep going. Uh, but when you give NIC to A4 in addition, you see they go way up. And so why is that? Are we converting those exhausted cells into these unexhausted? Probably not because there are epigenetic changes in those cells that they're locked in that triple positive, you know, ultra suppressive phenotype, so they can't. So we think what's going on here, and this is a subject of intense investigation right now because it has implications for how you treat with the combination, is that what we've done is made um, those CD8 effector cells resistant to becoming exhausted because c 4 in the presence of c 4 blockade, they can get co-stimulated again very much easier than if it's not there. And so you take PD-1 off the top, which allows them to proliferate, and then give them the ability to constantly go back and get co-stimulated again in the absence of that suppressive effect that c 4 has, and you may just keep them from ever becoming exhausted. And so the exhausted cells then become ir irrelevant. Uh, and so this actually shows here, the, the, that's the correlation of, of the, uh, the exhausted cells uh, with tumor size in control and monotherapy and the combination therapy, they're irrelevant. Those that are there are irrelevant too. And so, uh, if you go and look at the CD4 compartment, uh, there is PD-1 on those ICOS cells, and consistent with that, when you add PD-1 and c 4 you further increase the number of those. And so, you know, when, what you happen when you what happens when you give the two, is you change really from the those four types to the two most important ones, the CD4s, which could directly kill and help CD8s. And then we may be again present, preventing the CD8 effector cells were ever becoming exhausted. So if we could figure out how to do this and how to sustain it, we may not have to give this, the PD-1 antibody in the combination for so long. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but it's, you know, it's important to know uh, these sort of things. Just very quickly, but those CD4s, they have this ICOS molecule uh, that's... Um, for an, a tumor immunologist, that's unusual because uh, ICOS is on CD4 cells, but never on, on T cells associated with cancer. It's on either follicular T helper cells, which are in the lymph nodes and don't ever appear in cancer cells, cancer tissue, or regulatory T cells, which are the ones that actually turn immune responsive off. Um, but Pam Sharma, who runs the platform with me, and he's actually in, in a pre-surgical study of bladder cancer, showed that they're induced by ipilimumab 10 years ago. Uh, and since then, uh, we've done a lot of clinical studies showing that those cells are quite important in the therapeutic effects of NSC to 4 They contain all of the tumor-specific cells. They're associated with longer survival. Um, anyway, there's some functional details there that are important. But um, the most, one of the important things is if you get rid of ICOS or ICOS ligand, by using genetically modified mice and then try NSCLA4 therapy. It does not work very well. So you need that additional pathway, which anyway involves 
the, the P3 catase pathway and activation of things that increase the fact that these are TH1s. Anyway, so that gave us the idea since there was this new class of cells that maybe we could take advantage of the ICOS to improve efficacy. So we filed for, for a patent uh, actually after this. But anyway, we thought maybe if we gave a signal through ICOS with ICOS ligand, we could improve the efficacy of, of NSC-delay-4 therapy. So we made a tumor cell that expresses the ligand for ICOS, ICOS ligand or not, and they gave mice wild-type tumor, which obviously doesn't, mm -hmm. and then treated it with NSC-delay-4 with or without, uh, well, with a vaccine, with or without the ICOS ligand, and the data is here. Basically, the one on the top shows you that dashed line is what happens when you give NSC-delay-4 plus the vanilla vaccine without ICOS ligand. The blue dashed line is the one when you just have, the only difference there is you're given the ICOS ligand. You're given an ICOS signal. So you increase efficacy fourfold. And we know that's because you get these super, they're not more cells, they're just super functional. They make a lot more TNF-alpha and gamma interferon. Anyway, if you try that in ICOS knockout mice, you lose it. So it is working through that. So anyway, this is just an illustration of how if you pay attention, you know, you can find new things. So anyway, we filed for a patent on this, have started a small company and have a trial that's going on now uh, in patients with nsc 4 plus an agonistic antibody. This We don't have any data yet. That was on my acknowledgement slide at the start. So I just want to be for clarity, you know transparency. Uh, anyway, so I'll just wrap it up now. There's all kinds of combinatorial stuff going on. I won't go through that. And I'll just stop and hopefully there's time for a few questions. This is what we've been used to in cancer therapy for a long time. Coming up with a drug, treating a thousand patients, getting a p-value, seeing if we could move the median survival over by a few weeks or a few months, um, and then, you know, declaring victory and, and moving on. Uh, but the idea of Durable responses is something that's essentially been given up on until IPI, sorry, uh, until IPI, where we know with melanoma and some of these other cancers, we can get durable responses lasting a decade or more in about 20% of patients. And also, it moves them out about, IPI gives you about four months increase in the median. But the most important thing is the tail on that curve. And so, this, this last slide is aspirational, not data, but what we need to do is get that curve up as high as we can get it in as many different kinds of cancer as we can. And uh, the good news is I think that we can, we, can, we can do that in many kinds of cancer. And I have to say that in some, we're nowhere, in glioblastoma, really nowhere, and, and pancreatic cancer, um, I want to go through the reasons. We think we understand some of them. Uh, we're beginning to get some hints at pancreatic cancer, but we've got a lot of work to do, but I'm confident, you know, with careful study, you know, getting biopsies, doing the hard work of looking at the molecular and cellular changes that occur uh, when we're giving these sorts of manipulations to the immune system, we'll be able to come up with combinations. It may take four or five uh, different things. It may take chemo plus radiation plus these drugs, but whatever I think that we're looking for combinatorial therapies that I think hopefully we'll be able to move that survival tail up as high as we can get it uh, soon. So I'll stop there. Probably gone on too long. Are there any burning questions? Thank you.